continue with uh, <coughs> uh, discussing the period between 1400 and 1800, this time focusing on the Danubian principalities, what later become Romania. Um, uh, talk about, we'll talk about Croatia, <coughs> the Croatian lands, that put it that, put it, that's put it that way, um, the Bosnian lands, and um, the Serbians. Okay, well, uh, we discussed uh, the situation of the Polish, of the Hungarian state, uh, and of the Czechs, um, of Bohemia and Moravia before. Let's focus now on the three principalities that will later form Romania, uh, but throughout history they were not part of one uh, uh, country. Uh, and this is part of the, the very uh, issue, that when we look at history we look backwards, and we sort of assume that well, the entire no uh, North American continent should be and belong to this thing, the United States, as if history led to this ness of necessity. Although if you look in history, in actual what happened, um, you was, you know, what we see is uh, you know, uh, colonials, uh, dirty colonies pushing out the native populations, occupying just the eastern seaboard in the North America, competing with other colonial powers that, that claimed most of the continent, by the way, and then pushing them out, and then expanding in the, cons uh, in the process of state building and colonial uh, conquest in a way, right? Um, and, and so there's nothing predetermined in this, okay? Um, so this is, this is, this is our problem uh, whenever we, we talk history that, especially before we learn about history, that we tend to project reality today in, in the past and kind of assume that whatever is today will have to be and everything had to lead to this, right? No. There could have been many other uh, uh, things, and this this is just a just a stage, right? We don't know what will uh, what will be, you know. We're just a point in in history, right? This is just a stage. We don't know how it will look in in uh, in, 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 a, in a thousand years, ten thousand years, right? So that being said, so remember uh, the three principalities: Transylvania, Moldavia, uh, Moldavia or Moldova, and Wallachia, right? And these form, uh, the Moldavia and Wallachia form around the 14th century. Uh, Transylvania formed earlier, and as, as you see it here, uh, before the uh, Ottoman conquest, it was mostly under Hungarian, uh, of, a part of the Hungarian state or under the influence of the Hungarian state. These other two were weaker principalities, they didn't have kings, they had princes, and they were weaker principalities who, you see, they, they have to negotiate always their. their uh, uh, the rulers had to negotiate the political authority with the bigger, you know, holders of political authority, which were, you know, the state of Hungary and the state of uh, Poland, uh, the uh, state of Poland or the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania, and of course then the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire, which expands in this in this uh, uh, direction. Uh, thus, the history of these principalities will be, you know, sprinkled with. The, it's the story of battles against the Ottomans, <laughs> basically, or negotiations or failures uh, to agree with the Ottomans. Now, the, 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 remember that the, there is a major cultural division that will also be a, a political division. In fact, you see it here. You see, this is part of the uh, Kingdom of Hungary, later will be part of the Habsburg Empire, uh, and, and like this, right? And then you have Poland. This also coincides with the easternmost limit of the Western Christianity in the sense of, not of, again, understand what I'm, we talked about before, in the sense of a sphere of civilization, of culture, right, which will, uh, um, and, and of political values and so on, right. So this division goes right between these three principalities, and we, we have to talk about them differently because Moldova and Wallachia will be mostly, uh, you know, populated majority of the population will be well, Romanian speaking, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and so on. Why Transylvania? This is why we talk about it both in the history of Hungary and the history of Romania in the book, right? Because for most of the history, it was associated with the state of Romania, with, of Hungary, sorry. And but today, and since the 1918, it is part of uh, Romania. Also because for uh, it is, it, we can, you know, quite safely assume that a large part of the population was Romanian, uh, you know, even at the point when we're talking now. But again. Our understandings of what Romanian, Hungarian, whatever means, something based on ethnicity, is is so, is, is is different from what it, what uh, meant then, or rather from what mattered then. Because remember, what mattered in any of these states, in, in feudal systems, was not the language the peasants spoke, who had no political uh, role or voice, but it was 
um, it was the body of the nobility which, which had the political say. And the nobility, you know, was cultivated, spoke whatever languages uh, uh, circulated were the currency of the day, uh, and the language of literature or language of, language of culture and of the church in the West was Latin, uh, and the language of the court was Latin, and the official documents were all in Latin. Uh, while, uh, while here in the, uh, in the countries that fell on basically under Eastern uh, Christianity, uh, this is culturally, I'm talking about, Orthodox, uh, the, the major language uh, was, well, the church language rather was Slavonic. Right? So even in these principalities, which were majority of the population, the peasants, the regular people spoke uh, Romanian, which is a Latin based uh, Romance language, and we talked about why. Uh, in churches, because the Orthodox faith came from the south through the Slavic, uh, although from the from the Byzantine Empire, but through, came through the Slavic sort of a ch channel, uh, the language of the church was Slavonic. Now this will change in this period that we talk about here, and because the language of the church, which was the most important set of institutions uh, in each of these principalities, um, uh, because it was Slavonic, also the language of the court was Slavonic, like a sort of a Slavic dialect. But remember. The, the, these are Latin-speaking populations. Okay, so let's differentiate then between Transylvania, which was multi-ethnic, multi-religious, we talked about Transylvania in the previous lecture, and Moldova and Wallachia, which were, um, uh, first of all, weaker principalities and also part of a different sphere of culture. And this will remain, this will remain even up to today when they're part of one country. There is a significant cultural difference between the West, this part, and, and this part. And even in the elections, you see this difference. Just like in Ukraine, you will see, you have today a civil war in Ukraine, basically, with the intervention of the Russians, because there is a significant cultural divide between the eastern part of Ukraine and the western part of Ukraine. Remember, borders, political borders, do not coincide with actual borders. Right? Uh, Kundera said imaginary borders. Well, they're not imaginary in the sense that they are imagined, but they're not, uh, they do not coincide with the, whatever ha happens to be the political border at the time. Uh, the borders of cultures do not coincide with political borders. And this creates problems, of course, right? Okay, so uh, a few major figures in the, in the history of these provinces. Mircha, the old, 14th century, participates in large coalitions against the Ottomans. So always you have the ruler who kind of either fights the Ottomans or, or uh, 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 negotiates with them or pays tribute and so on. <coughs> then, after the, uh, 1415, Ottoman authority is imposed on these two provinces, Moldova and Wallachia. But unlike the Balkans, the rest of the Balkans and what will become the rest of the Ottoman uh, territory proper, this, what's special about these provinces, Moldova and Wallachia, is that they never really became part of the Ottoman Empire. So even when they were under the influence and had to pay a yearly tribute, right, and even when the rulers were sort of appointed with the approval of the uh, high port of the, of the court of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, still, they, they had their own system of government, they owned their own uh, sub well, sovereignty, right? They had their own, their own system of government. They never became a part of the Ottoman. That's very important. It's very important because it shapes a different type of history than those of the peoples who were part of the Ottoman Empire, as we'll see. Okay, other important names Stephen the Great of Moldova, um, again, fights the Ottomans. Uh, builds churches, monasteries, some fantastically beautiful monasteries that you can visit in northern Romania, northeast Romania, in Moldova. Uh, then, John Hunyadi, or Hunyadi Janos, who was of Transylvania and who rose to prominence in the Hungarian kingdom. What, what was his ethnicity? This is one of those figures that appears both in the Romanian history books and Hungarian history books, both claiming that it's, well, he was Romanian, he was Hungarian. That's, the point is that they're trying to read backwards something that then was not uh, was not actually relevant, you know. Whatever, what was his uh, ancestry was not relevant. He spoke whatever languages he needed to spoke, and probably he spoke Hungarian because he rose to uh, authority in the Hungarian kingdom. Who cares what his mom or his dad was? Um, but he he he. Uh, this John Hunyadi uh, uh, achieves a, a major victory in uh, Belgrade. Uh, often these rulers or these leaders will fight together with Western, you know, sort of alliances. Because the West will always try to put together alliances to push back the Ottomans, push back the Ottomans, and it was always a struggle to, to put together alliances, right? 
uh, well, who's going to pay, who's going to send soldiers, just like today, something different. And, um, but these were on the front lines. And th their history is marked by, again, as I mentioned several times before, by this perception of we are on the front lines, we have defended Europe. You know, and they were praised indeed in the chronicles of the time, and the, the rulers of the time, for being sort of the defenders of Christendom, uh, as they were understood to be. Although these were not, you know, Catholic. Um, and uh, another famous figure that you've heard about, it's Vlad the Impaler, you know, Vlad uh, Dracul, uh, which is from which you have the, 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 we have the legend of Dracula, right? He was the guy who impaled and whatever, that he was not a vampire. Uh, but anyway, he was quite a, a brutal ruler in the sense of he administers, administers justice with very brutal means. Um, he impaled people, yes. Uh, and he was a ruler of Transylvania, uh, of, of Alakia, but all, uh, who maintained his throne uh, in, uh, you know, sort of a relationship and under the patronage of the Hungarian state and so on. But again, another famous, important figure, his rule remains as a very severe, brutal, but also very, um, uh, you know, he made order into the lands. And even today, in, in the common parlance in Romania, you will hear people, uh, in Romanian society, you will hear people, you know, making reference with even other bad being paid to put order into things. Um, okay, by the 16th century, the, 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 in, the um, influence of the, so here's 1600, the influence of the Ottoman Empire over these principalities will be very clear. Remember that in 1526, um, uh, the Ottomans win at Mohac and took, take control of half of Hungary. Uh, and remember that the Transylvania will remain uh, separate and more, more independent than the rest of, uh, of, of Hungary, well, of, than Hungary, west of Transylvania. Uh, which will become part of the Ottoman Empire, while Transylvania remain under its own governance, right? That's very important. Same with Valachia and same with Moldova. Uh, uh, so let's, let's talk about a little bit about culture. So Transylvania, multi-ethnic, uh, you had uh, Romanians, mostly, most of them being peasants, Eastern Orthodox, then you had, uh, um, this is 1600, uh, you had uh, Hungarians and uh, German-speaking uh, population and settlers who were today associated with Hungarians, but kind of a different origin. Well, these, uh, these populations were either Catholic or Protestant. Protestantism, as I said, had a huge impact in this area. Uh, Protestant, by that I mean uh, um, Lutheran or Calvinist. The Lutheran Church in Europe is called Evangelical. It's not the same with what we call here in the United States Evangelical, which are churches that were founded in the 19th century, basically, Baptist or 20th century. Um, but uh, Evangelical means Lutheran, and Calvinist means Reformed. Right? That's what, that's what the, they are called. These are part of the original branches of Protestantism that came about in the 16th century. But that's all, you have multi-ethnic and you saw that, So it, plus it's a Western-oriented society, it's part of the Renaissance, it's a, it's a very flourishing, it's, you know, uh, it's at, you know, part of the West in a way. Uh, the Valachia and Moldova, they were more, they kept the Byzantine um, sort of culture. And by that what I mean is that the Byzantine Empire was a very hierarchical empire. The ruler was, was quasi-absolute, uh, and he was the patron of everything in the country, uh, including the church. And this is very important, um, and I want you to remember this and to understand it clearly, uh, that uh, in the East, as I mentioned, the East, Eastern Orthodox churches are organized, are auto settlers, right? Which means that each of the particular churches has its own head. Uh, and they organized along political lines. So basically, in Moldova, you would have one Orthodox church in Valachia, another Orthodox church, and so on. While today in Romania, you have in the whole of Romania one Orthodox church. So you see, it kind of varies with the border, right? Or with the with the extent of a given society. Because they are the the hierarchy kind of ends at, within a territory. Whenever that is the case, these churches are more vulnerable to political authority, to political influence. And that is the case, for example, with Anglican church, the Anglican churches, which is under the king. Even today, the queen is the formal head of the Anglican church. It's true with the Protestant states in the North, uh, North Europe, even today, which are state churches. For example, the Danish Lutheran Church is a state church. It's, a, uh, it's closely linked with the state, and it's bound by the state. But that makes them vulnerable to political power. And in the history of the Byzantine Empire, the emperor always had a sort of an authority also over the church. Because this relationship between church and state has always been a conundrum. So, uh, what is the what is the 
because you know the church has a specific purpose, the state has a specific purpose. They, however, do meet and do overlap, right? It's, uh, uh, but they're not the same thing. Well, in Eastern Orthodox churches, there has been a tradition also because the Eastern Orthodox churches are sort of a little bit more otherworldly than the Catholic and Protestant churches. By which I mean that the model of perfect Christianity for uh, the, in Eastern Orthodox, to, to, to simplify brutally, is, is, uh, is basically the monastic model, model, you know, it's basically a life completely dedicated to God. So they have a less of a tradition of engaging the social dimension, the social political dimension. By social I mean life in society. Um, that's very important. Because, um, uh, you know, so uh, that's very important because in these principalities then there was nothing to oppose the ruler. So there is a tradition in, uh, the, the Byzantine tradition is one of a, a very powerful ruler who, who rules almost at whim, what we would call almost an absolute ruler, right? But not so in the West where, you know, there has been a long struggle between church and state in the sense of the church uh, fighting for its independence from the ruler of the given rule, uh, from the rule of the given ruler at any point. Uh, independence that also meant that, uh, you know, sort of a spiritual independence from polit politics, okay? Um, and also because the Catholic Church is universal, as I mentioned, in the sense of uh, the organization, the structure, is not bound by a specific political uh, entity, in each specific land, um, you know, the, the, the given ruler could not control the church completely because it simply, the hierarchy went beyond him, okay? So that's a very important thing and, and that kind of undermines the power of the rulers in the West, the powers of the, the power. And this is why also absolute monarchs, you won't really have absolute monarchs until early modernity in the West, in the, uh, you know, because uh, that's for, for various other reasons, but that's when, uh, when uh, this check on their power would, would weaken. So to speak. Now, it's important because we talk about culture, society, politics, society, and culture. And, and Kundera talks about the fact that Russian culture has always been different from the northern Slavic culture, the Polish, or the Czechs, or the whatever, right? There's a tradition, Kundera says, of, of right, the, the pride of the civic rights uh, of, the, of the Polish, which is actually the rights of the nobles, as I mentioned, right? Because the nobles were the political body, and the king got their power from them. Now, unlike, this is very different in Russia, where the Tsar, let's say later, uh, we don't have it yet, but the, the rulers were absolute rulers in the sense that they ruled everything, including their authority was also about the church, right? Uh, and this, this is why he says that, in, in many ways, communism, the way uh, it happened in Russia, says Kundera, uh, in the Soviet Union, was also sort of a natural consequence of this history of absolute ruler. Of, of, a, of, a, of a large body of people who are, who are nobody and the ruler is every, everything. Unlike in these western lands. So and this, this is why culture actually does, does, does matter. Because this sort of a, how, how do we view the political body and how do we view the position of the ruler? And how do we view what the ruler, are the limits on the power of the ruler? What are the limits? Right? Um, um, or does he have rule power over everything? Now, the Byzantine tradition is of a ruler that has power over everything and rules of, at his whim. And everybody else's position really depends just on his whim, you know. And that's a different view of political role than the one that will develop in the, in the West. Okay, that being said, um, so remember that in Transylvania, most Romanians were peasants. We talked about this yesterday, we talked about the um, uh, structure, of political and social structure of Transylvania. Another important name here is the Michael the Brave, Mihai Vityazul, um, who of Valachia, who, uh, this is a key moment in thought in, well, Romanian history, especially national, nationalistic history, uh, or hist nationalistic think on history. Uh, uh, 1600, in 16th century, right, but anyway, in 1600, Michael the Brave, Mihai Vityazul, is, um, um, well, he was a very successful ruler in Wallachia, and he kind of, um, through various machinations and through gathering troops from both three lands, including the settlers from Transylvania, he managed to get a hold of all three thrones. All three thrones. So in 1600, for about four, six years, four, five, six years, right? A very short period, or even three years, 
uh, I don't recall exactly, Michael the Brave unifies the three provinces, right? And from the perspective of later Romania, this, this again, reading history is sort of a deterministic mode that, okay, uh, you know, they always try to be one, of course that's not the case, but they always try to be one. This is sort of the key moment that this is the first time when Romania appears. Now, of course, it was not called Romania, that he wasn't intending to create a Romania, uh, you know, he put his hands on three thrones. Just like, you know, here the monarch put his hands on two thrones, Poland and Lithuania. They remained separate and so on. There is a fact that there was, there was a consciousness that was growing of, of the fact that, well, there were Romanian speakers here and here and here. But again, until modernity, this, doesn't, this is not a relevant criterion of political organization. Okay, but he doesn't, this union, the union, quote unquote, doesn't last uh, uh, long. But I posted a, uh, a picture, a painting of him walking into um, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of a capital of Transylvania uh, and have, have triumphantly, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, tellingly it's a painting from 1919, right, or 19th century. Just like that painting I posted about the Battle of Kosovo is from 1919. Now notice that why is it then that they paint these events, right? Because this is the age, the 19th century, early 20th century of nationalism. This is when you reread history in a specific key. And this is when you depict those events that serve to that reading of history. Okay. Um, also, you know, in Moldova and Wallachia, I told you about the social structure in Transylvania, but in Moldova and Wallachia, um, besides the fact that the ruler was very powerful, uh, the the peasants were also, um, the situation of the peasants was very bad, uh, and the boyars, who were the nobility, the boyars, had, uh, you know, almost absolute power over their peasants. So, feudalism of very sort. Okay, in, uh, six, at the end of the 17th century, in 1699, Treaty of Karlowitz, uh, the Turks are defeated, the Ottomans are defeated, sorry, and uh, pushed back. And the Austrian, uh, the Hafner monarchy expands, and this is a very good map because it shows you, it shows you um, not just the, the, the big uh, units but also the small units within. And you see that the Austrian monarchy has the crown of Hungary, so it's a, it's, a, it's an empire, the Habsburg Empire, is an Austrian monarchy has a crown. There's a there's a crown of Hungary. There are the the, the Austrian lands proper. There's a crown of uh, um, the kingdom of Croatia and Slovenia. You see, there it's an empire formed of many other subunits, each of them with their own structure, and this is key because even if it's in a, within a larger empire, even if, it, if it, let's think of an empire as a confederal unit. Now, even when, when the states of the United States, the first states, first thirteen states, were part of the confederation, they still retained their identity. Even today, when there has been so much centralization of power in the United States in this federal system, you can still say that there is a if are Washington, there's an Oregon, there's whatever. But what makes it exist? What does it mean that there is a Washington? There isn't actually, right? Because these borders are conventions, constructs, right? What makes it exist is that there are political structures that have a certain sovereign power, certain amount of autonomous power in these lands, these, these separate parts, right? So you have a government of Washington, a government of Oregon, a government of whatever. So there is different systems of administrations with their own distinct power under a national power, okay? And this set of institutions, the existence of these individual distinct sets of institutions with separate uh, spheres of power is what makes those things exist, which we call Washington, Oregon, and whatever. Institutions make, you know, create reality, okay? Uh, we'll talk about more about this uh, next week when we talk about the modern nation state. But this is very important to, then, to understand how important it was uh, that the uh, Croatian lands, right, that the Croatian lands were, um, uh, from the beginning, when they became part of the Hungarian state, for, of which they would be a part uh, for about a thousand years, right, uh, they would maintain their own institutions. So there would be the diet, so we're talking about Croatia now, uh, there would be the diet uh, of the nobles of Croatia, which was called the Sabor, and there would be a Viceroy, which was called the Ban, a sort of a governor of those lands. And that meant that there was a set of institutions here that maintained its existence and thus Croatia existed. 
Because again, what is creation? What is the United States? It doesn't exist, right? What, what exists, you know, there's Adam in the absolute, right? What is the United States? It's a set of institutions. It's a set of political institutions that have authority over a territory. Without these, there would be no United States, right? There would be people living in whatever, right? For, the United States is a political entity. Political entities are formed of institutions uh, with coherent uh, center of power. That's what creates these political entities. Now, even within a larger political entity, the fact that you have smaller political entities, distinct ones, is what gives them reality. So when Croatia will be reformed in the 1990s, it won't be an invention. Because it has existed throughout history with its own sphere of authority, even if part of other larger political units. Okay? That's why, and this is also why it's very important that there was a, 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 a sort of a parliament of Transylvania, that Moldavia and Valachia, although under Turkish influence and Really, the rulers were appointed and dismissed by the Turkish uh, crown, the Turkish court, the Ottoman uh, court. Still, they maintain their own administrative systems, their own uh, spheres of, uh, of, of, of power, you know. And that's very important because that, that, you know, that means that they exist. Same with the crown of Hungary, it becomes part of the Austrian monarchy, but institutions remain, remember, right? And the same for the crown of Bohemia, and so on. Okay, so the Croatian lands, now the Croatian lands, remember that they, they were, there were several. There's the Royal Croatia, so-called, uh, there's Armatia, and these are different regions. There's Istria, uh, there is, um, uh, what was it, um, Slavonia. So these are different, uh, and we, I, I showed you, uh, and you have a map of, of, of these different lands. Uh, so these are different, um, so for example, this is the kingdom of Croatia, I said Slovenia, it's wrong, Slavonia, that's different, that's not Slovenia. Don't confuse these things, just like Slovaks are not the same as Slovenes, yeah? Complicated? Well, this is why we're here to learn these things. Um, so, Sla uh, 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 Slavonia was a land part of Croatia. Slovenia is a different thing. That's to the west. The Slovenes are different. This is all part of today's Croatia in history, but they're different. So the coast part, you see, was Dalmatia was under Venetian, under Venice, of Venetian authority. Croatia, Royal Croatia and Slavonia was part of the Austrian uh, monarchy. So what is today uh, Croatia? One, it was at the border with the Ottoman Empire, and many of basically the entire population was employed as, as border guard, basically. So the entire Lands there were paid by the emperor to defend the borders because there was no standing army, remember, right? Um, while so, and different lands fall under different uh, controls, but again, this, this, this history of, of being at, at the borderlands, right? Um, and they remain under the Habsburg. When in the uh, 18th century, the, uh, the, the Hungarian nobles remember they kind of revolted against the Habsburgs, against, they wanted again to have their own independent, sovereign, separate uh, state, uh, they allied themselves with the Croatian nobles, because there is this history of, you know, cooperation, of being part of the same unit, and at that point the Habsburgs will be the common enemy, um, but later, you'll see in the 19th century, things will change when, because the Croatian, Croatian nobles will ally themselves with the Habsburgs, because they were oppressed by the Hungarian nobles, so, you know, different alliances. But anyway, there is a point when uh, the Croatian nobles are the Hungarian nobles against the Habsburg uh, uh, rule. Um, but, you know, that's, that's in short, this is, takes us to the year 1800. Uh, in, in Croatia, the idea is that these lands were mostly part of the Habsburg Empire, they, re they remained a, di a separate diet, a separate sabor, um, uh, through which the nobles uh, represented Croatia and, and basically governed, uh, uh, you know, the, the emperor governed through that sabor uh, and different lands, different parts, however, some of them went in and out of the jurisdiction of the, of the Habsburgs. So, I don't know, 1800, you see that by this time the Habsburgs have also taken the nation. Okay, um, Bosnia. This is very interesting. And without understanding this period, we will not understand, for example, the wars in former Yugoslavia of the 1990s. So, let's go back to 1400, and you see that, and remember that in the Middle Ages there was a, power, there was a significant Bosnian state for a shorter while. 
uh, Boston State. Well, there was a ruler in that area. There were rulers in the, that area, and but uh, you know that state even expanded. But it was plagued by inner weaknesses. Uh, division between the nobles, a very weak central king, a very weak central authority of the king, and that, you know, if you don't have the central authority of the king, this is why it was important to have a strong king, because that's the guarantee of having strong institutions, that's the guarantee of statehood. Okay? Divided nobles shall not one unified statehood make. Uh, and when the Ottomans push in and defeat the Serbs and so on, the, this, this land that was so divided socially and culturally, you know, there are, there are three churches, which means three, three, three views on, on life, three identities and, and so on, when, when they push in, you know, uh, uh, there's no one to oppose them. There's no, because, you know, again, governments are the ones that can mobilize these resources and use them, i.e. opposition is only, can only be made by you know, institutions, right, and, and the uh, common central authority. Anyway, these lands fall under Ottoman rule, and Bosnia remain, remain under Ottoman rule from the 15th century until, uh, literally, until the 20th century, the late 19th century, early 20th century. Now, what is important here, uh, and if you look closely at the map, you will uh, be able to read it, I don't know if this is, uh, this is clear right here, um, how did it, what was life in the Ottoman Empire? I started talking about this last, uh, yes, uh, in the previous uh, lecture, but uh, let me again uh, point out certain things. In the Ottoman lands proper, this is why it's important that these lands were not part of the Ottoman Empire. Because in the Ottoman Empire proper, uh, well, the Ottomans were uh, uh, of Turkic origin. Right? And uh, they took over a large part of what was before the sphere of uh, uh, original sphere of, of Islam, uh, the first, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, political units that were uh, formed after the uh, appearance of of, uh, of Islam. But the Ottomans kind of were a warrior caste, a warrior people who were employed by the first. Islamic rulers, and then, the, you know, that's what happens when the rulers weaken, is that the soldiers take over. So the Ottomans took over the entire territory and organized themselves so successfully that they expanded, you see, not just here, and in Africa, and in Asia, and everywhere. So it was a, a warrior society. But it was also an Islamic-based society, which meant that for, it was feudal. So you had a clear hierarchy within the Ottoman Empire, within the Muslims, right, Muslim population. But the, the view, and this is the, the, what we need to understand, is that the view of citizenship, this is why it's important, religion is not important because of, in this discussion, because of faith, and it's not individual what you feel in the heart, that, that I don't care about that, yeah, in that sense. What it means politically is that it, 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 it's, a, it's, what it, uh, it's important politically because it shapes the outlook on, on uh, what, is, uh, what are the rules of behavior, what are the rules of living together, what are the rules of us living together as a society, i.e. how we should organize our society, okay? If you think that everybody is created equal by God, for whatever reason you think that, then you have to give them equal rights. And slavery will not work, right? This is why the anti-slavery movements in 19th century America were, or in Britain, were religious movements. And Martin Luther King was a religious, uh, uh, you know, because that was the philosophical underpinning of what they were saying. They said, we cannot treat them as less than human because in the eyes of God they're human. But that's, remember, that's a philosophical position. If you don't subscribe to the fact that, you know, we are all, they are all equal in front of God, then what is your argument that all human beings should have equal rights? Not very clear. Okay. Uh, and if there is, there needs to be a very clear uh, view. It's not a given. It's not a given. It never was in history. Right. Yeah? Slavery always existed. Not racial but slavery, but the fact that one person was owned by others from the ancient Greeks. And nothing to do with race. Right? So the point is that there are philosophical underpinnings that we need to understand. Uh, and this is why religion matters in our discussion. It matters for many other reasons, uh, perhaps in your, uh, you know, uh, your own uh, life and whatever, but in, in this political uh, discussion. Um, so, in the Ottoman Empire, right, um, because uh, the body of believers is, the, is the, basically the, 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 the people of God. They are all equal. For example, that in Islam, all believers are equal, in Sunni Islam, which is the one that dominated here, not Shia. In Sunni Islam, all believers are equal, which means that the Pasha, right, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire, was not a higher 
entity than any of the individual subjects if he was higher politically, financially, whatever, of course. It's just feudalism. But it, 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 religiously he wasn't. Right? But that doesn't sound too strange. Yes. But those who are not part of the, of the people of God, who didn't follow uh, Muhammad, and, and who was the, the only and last prophet, the last prophet of God, right? they well, either had to convert, if they were, uh, or if they were Christian or Jewish, uh, they were considered to be sort of second class. Second class because uh, in Islam, you know, the, 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 the scriptures of the Jewish people and scriptures of the Christians are considered to be holy books. In Islam, right? So the followers of those scriptures, the followers of those beliefs are considered to be part of this lineage that leads to Islam, leads to Muhammad. It's kind of their backward sort of. They didn't, they didn't get to where they should be, right? So they're not quite there, sort of speak, right? This is why they were not persecuted per se in the sense of, you know, being forced to convert or anything, right? Although, you know, it's always encouraged. But they were, you know, they didn't have the same status. And what mattered in terms of your citizenship status, citizenship, I'm implying the concept that didn't exist then, but what mattered uh, was uh, how you were categorized. I mean, look at the same empire. Thousands of languages were spoken here. But what mattered was to, to which of these, to, did, you, did you belong to the people of God, to the servant of God, or did you belong to other clubs? Right? So this is why, this is why it's important, because it meant that the, Christ, that, uh, that the Christians, how, what was their fate? Well, uh, they were sort of second-class citizens in the sense that they, uh, they weren't, you know, uh, uh, killed or, or anything, but they didn't have access to certain positions. So they couldn't climb the ranks of, of money, of, of society, of politics, if you were a Christian or a Jew or, or whatever, right? Well, with differences, because, for example, the Greeks had a special relationship. <laughs> so, but the, so, yeah, I'm referring to the Slavic peoples here. Remember, the Bulgarians, that we will call later Macedonians, the Albanians, the this and this and this, the, the Serbians, the Serbians, right? They will be governed, um, uh, they will be governed distinctly. They will be said, okay, you are Slavic Christians here. And they will be encouraged to organize around their church. And guess what? This is where it's important that these were Eastern Orthodox. Because to start with, they had the, 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 each Eastern Orthodox church was organized within each society. So this is how Serbian identity, for example, right, was maintained in these lands after it became part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries by virtue of the Serbian Orthodox Church. And that's a crucial thing. That the Serbian Orthodox Church becomes synonymous with Serbian identity and uh, vice versa, and with a certain length. It's also important that most of these uh, Slavic peoples remained for centuries peasants. And those who wanted to advance, they had to join, to join in, right? So you have many who will join the Muslim religion, some of them will be recu recruited. There was this practice of, um, of um, uh, child tribute. You know, there was such a thing as Christians taken from Christian villages, taken to Istanbul, converted to Islam, educated, and will become, you know, some huge, uh, some of them will be occupying huge functions in the state. But some families, even Muslim families, gave their children, it was sort of a scholarships for some, must, even Muslim families, uh, to, to have their children sent to Istanbul and become the elite of the empire. Others were forcibly taken. So, you know, there were all these things together happening. But, uh, so, back to Bosnia, we're going to talk about Serbia in a second. Uh, in Bosnia, what happens, now understand, remember that at the time that the Ottoman Empire takes over here, and this culture is, is instated, unlike, for example, in the state of Hungary that has had a solid history and a strong culture and a very distinct uh, Catholic, uh, you know, structure and so on, or church structure, here you don't have any of these. So you don't have a strong identity that could oppose this, you know, century-long, dominance of a different culture, different political system, different society, and so on. And this will be, a lot will become dissolved into this, into this uh, system. And hence you will have many who are, uh, you know, uh, Slavic speakers who will be Muslim. Well, guess what? These are what in the 20th century were called Bosniaks. The actual Bosniaks. Because they will speak the same dialect as the Serbians, and the same dialect actually as the Croatians, or very similar, or the same. 
But you will know that they are different because they dress a little bit differently and they, uh, it's not, again, religion is a way of life, not as a, you know, whatever you feel in your heart, or whatever, such nonsense. Okay. They will form a separate society. Okay? And so this is why today, today in Bosnia, we have Serbians, Croats, and Bosniaks. And who are these Bosniaks and how do you know them? Well, and not all of them believe, by the way, right? But it has become, just like in order to, to compare, it's like in Northern Ireland where you had a long history of uh, resistance to English rule, right? And you had all this f fighting, civil war between, it was said, Catholics and Protestants. And of course it wasn't between Catholics and Protestants, because there was, it also wasn't a religious war. But, it, was ju it just happens that those who were Protestant were either those who in the English brought in to Ireland, to rule Ireland as English, or those who sided with the English in this occupation of Ireland. So Protestant became a byword for on the side of English, and Catholic became a byword of Irish. Okay, Irish who are with the side of the Irish. So it's actually national identity in the 20th century that will be defined along with the help of religious lines. It's not about religion. Right? Um, the same here will become. Uh, this is a parenthesis, but it helps you. We, it, it, I hope it helps clarify certain concepts. But the point is that Bosnia will become. And here's the other thing. There is an Eyalet of Bosnia. What is an Eyalet? The Eyalet was the um, uh, uh, um, administrative tool, the administrative form, um, the form in which the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, divided itself. Think of it as, uh, you know, provinces, right? Well, these were the Eyalets. And here's the big thing. There was an Eyalet of Bosnia. While there was no such thing as Eyalet of Bulgaria or Eyalet of, uh, of Serbia, I mean, this was Eyalet of Romania occupied the entire Eastern Balkans. Now, Eyalet of Bosnia occupied what is mostly of what is today Bosnia. So it's the same case as, as you have here, where you have a principality of Transylvania within the Habsburg Empire, or the less of a, you know, with its own self government. Well, guess what? In Bosnia, it will have its own administrative structure within the larger Ottoman Empire. That's important for the existence of a history of a Bosnian entity. Right? Besides that state that uh, existed and then disappeared. Okay. Uh, uh.